Welcome, everyone. My name is uh, Cedric de Kooning. I'm uh, one of the coordinators of the Effectiveness of Peace Operations Network, uh, and I work at the Norwegian Institute for International Affairs. So uh, it's a great pleasure and to welcome you all this afternoon to our uh, seminar on focusing on uh, this new report, our report on shifting from external dependency remodeling the G5 Sahel joint force for the future. Um, you, most of you probably aware, but just a, a few words about uh, the effectiveness of peace operations network. Uh, this is a network consisting of more than 40 research institutions and individual researchers that uh, collaborate on doing research into the effectiveness of specific peace operations. Um, this particular study is a bit different from the kind of studies we do where we look into the effectiveness of a particular operation in a particular period of time. It's part of a new type of study that we started doing in the last two years, looking specifically into informing mandate renewal processes. And so with the withdrawal of, of uh, first uh, Barkhan, Operation Barkhan and, and other uh, international, especially European initiatives uh, in, in the context of Mali, but then eventually also um, the shifting of, of the G5 Sahel force, uh, their operations outside of Mali. We thought it's very important to look together at what are some of the future options for, for the G5 Sahel force in this context? And that's why we commissioned this study. So we are really thankful to all the contributors and authors who in, in a fairly short period of time pulled this study together. And we, we hope it's a contribution to the dialogue that is starting now, also in terms of the joint uh, United Nations African Union ECOWAS assessment, and that it will be an, a contribution and input into that study. But um, let me hand over to our moderator today, Dr. Linda Darkwa. Uh, she is the coordinator of the Training for Peace program. And uh, this, is, this uh, report has been a joint effort between the Effectiveness of Peace Operations Network and the Training for Peace program. So Linda, over to you, thank you. Thank you very much, Cedric. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you find yourself uh, at this period. This has now become a very famous uh, greeting, uh, thanks to COVID. It is an honor to moderate today's already mentioned, and we do contribute to the work of the Effectiveness of Peace Support Operations Network. Um, but just a little bit about the Training for Peace program. The Training for Peace program is a Norwegian capacity um, support mechanism that is given to the African Union Commission. It started about 26 years ago and it's still uh, going strong. And in addition to the work that we do directly with the um, African Union Commission, we also support studies such as this one to inform not only the United Nations work, but as most of you are aware, peacekeeping is now partnership. And so to inform that partnership as well. So thank you very much for joining all seeing the concept note for today's work, but the work of the G5 Sahel could not um, be in much more demand than it is now. We see that not only are we having major challenges in the Sahel, but also with the creeping of violent extremism and terrorism into the coastal uh, states of West Africa, there is a real need to ensure that the withdrawal of the French forces do not leave a gap which can be exploited. And so it, for me, when I was asked to moderate this session, I found it um, first as a West African that this is something that is absolutely critical. And so I thank the authors very, very much. But also as a researcher, I found it interesting. Uh, Cedric and colleagues, congratulations, because I believe that this is new, this is fresh, and will inform uh, future research. I am informed that um, Dr. Fifi Edua, for one of the um, authors of the study, who would probably have kicked us off is still trying to connect. It's been raining 
um, in Accra. Um, I don't know where he is at the moment, but if he's in Accra, he's probably having challenges because we've had some serious rains. Um, and so until we get, uh, we get him on board, um, may I call on uh, uh, Delina, get Delina Gojo, who is the um, Associate Fellow of the Royal Institute for International Relations um, to start us off. Uh, and then we will see who we get on uh, next. So Delina, you have 10 minutes, but since your co-panelists are not on yet, um, take the liberty and just dive in. All right, all right. Thank you very much, Linda. And thank you for the invitation and also for, for including me throughout this drafting project um, on, of this report um, with, uh, you know, with requests for comments and, uh, and an interview with, uh, with Andrew and his colleagues. Um, it was, a, I, I think it's a very interesting report and especially the, the scenario drawing, the scenario that, that you present. Um, I, feel, I feel like that is always a very difficult exercise. And so it's quite courageous to, to give that a try. But I suppose, I mean, this is one of the, advantages and uh, one of the specificities of, uh, of Yipon as well. So I'm going to provide you with a fairly local point of view because I thought this could be a little more useful than, than looking at the joint force from above, which is something that you all know how to do. Um, but I think giving some context on what is currently happening in Niger and why I think uh, even the scenario that you present may be problematic for a country like Niger, and if it is problematic for a country like Niger, what would it be with the with the rest of the of the countries within the tri-border area specifically? Um, so the. I, I have been based here for a, for a few months now. My research, my PhD research, focuses on Niger specifically and on the idea of remote warfare. Um, what is happening more more specifically in Tawa and in Tilaberi, so in these two departments of the Nigerian state, which which border Mali and Burkina. Um, I would then provide a very brief commentary on the joint force and the EPON report, and then we'll try to put these two parts together and see what the viability of the scenario uh, would, would be. Um, for Niger specifically. So on the redeployment of transformed Barkhane, and you talk about this quite a lot in the report of the transformed Barkhane to Niger, what is happening in Mali obviously has reverberations here as well, not just for security reasons, but also political and diplomatic. Um, while Barkhane would provide better security to the Garde Nationale, which is the main uh, troop uh, in Niger, which is deployed in uh, Tilaberi and Tawa, others also are, but the most um, the, the, the frontier areas is mostly La Garde Nationale, uh, and they are currently struggle, struggling quite a lot in Tilaberi and Tawa. It also means that every failure on the part of the French will be badly perceived in those areas should they fail to protect civilians. And this, of course, uh, puts uh, this, this analysis in a, in, a, in a difficult situation because for the French, uh, their mission is a counterterrorism one, but the way civilians perceive it, and there are a number of studies that will come out on this uh, that are quite updated, the way civilians perceive foreign presence is as potential protectors for them. Uh, Niger's president Bazoum is not uh, just pursuing the military strategy and even from a military point of view he's tackling the issue from a variety of angles um, but he's also negotiating with armed groups and seeking to build better community cohesion programs not just in areas touched by violence but also those areas with a potential for being targeted in the future and I think this is quite illuminating uh, if we if we compare it to what has happened in Mali and in Burkina and is still happening. Um, I am afraid to say that the joint force does not feature as a relevant topic of discussion here in Niger uh, in terms of, uh, of the Assemblée Nationale, for example. So, so the parliament on much. Um, and I don't believe that this was based on the fact that there was external dependency necessarily, but rather on the lack of trust between Sahelian governments and Sahelian ministries themselves. So despite what Bazoum said in a May 18 interview, uh, this, is, this is quite recent, it was last month, uh, he said, I don't want to insult my army, 
That's why I won't hire the services of Europeans to wage war in our place. And still, I believe it would be a hard sell for civilians in villages along the borders um, to, to see it this way. So um, there was, there was I, I think it's also worth mentioning this, there was another speech that Bazoum gave a few months before it was February, and this was for a much more national audience, a la Conférence des Cadres, where he asked Europeans, or he said, he asked his people really, uh, to accept the presence of Europeans uh, because they would be needed. Now, this also means uh, that he sees no future for Wagner in Niger, and again, uh, I, I, this, this is particularly relevant given what is happening in Mali, but this is the only good news. Um, now, how does the joint force uh, come into play here? I honestly thought that the joint force, uh, I thought of the joint force very differently when I was based in Brussels. Uh, for example, instruments, and maybe Vianney uh, will, be, will be exploring a little more on this as well. Um, the OHCHR compliance framework for human rights, which is work that Civic uh, also did, um, was an incredibly useful instrument for atten attempting a seep in of a more strict HR framework within joint force um, operations. Uh, it would be a mechanism that was owned by them. So this is, you know, it's not dependency on external actors, but there was, there was this principle of ownership. Um, but, but from there to then trickle down to national armies, this is something that that we haven't seen, and I, and I wonder whether we ever will, and I, and I doubt it. And in general, on the perception of the joint force from here, the Nigerian state did not, uh, I don't know how to put it other than, did not believe in the dream of, of this joint force. Um, and one way for us to see it from its inception, one way for us to see it is that it, Niger did not send its best people simply. So the, the idea that the joint force would be useful was something that wasn't particularly present in policy circles here. Now, the scenario that you draw in the report um, all have a potential for coming about, I think. Um, but since what EPON does is to evaluate effectiveness, I believe none would be truly effective given the lack of willingness on the part of state actors. All of this to say that if it is hard to imagine Niger truly backing such an initiative or uh, one of the four scenario that, that you draw, what hope do we have for Bamako or Ouagadougou? And this does not mean that all, all is lost in the three border area, precisely the initiatives that I just described. So for example, negotiations with armed groups, which um, are primarily in this case, Niger led, could have a positive impact without the need uh, to waste money and resources on yet another big institution such as the force. I, I, I don't know whether this was, um, this was too controversial, or I don't think so. Uh, but I would, I would be keen to hear what everyone else thinks. Thank you. I'm not sure what's happening to my light here, but thank you very much. Um, you've given us a good overview, albeit that the focus has been on Niger uh, at this period, but it. It's interesting to hear. One of the things that I have been a bit concerned about is the, the rift between Mali and Niger and its implications on the overall fight uh, against terrorism from your other panelists. So, um, Verni, if I may come to you. No, thank you yeah. very much. You've got 10 minutes uh, to intervene. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity and uh, also for the study. Uh, I had really a very good chance to discuss with uh, uh, the team and also to provide some comments. And um, I work with uh, the Center for Syrian Conflict, CIVIC. Uh, we, we cover mostly the G5 style. And we start our work in the G5 Sahel, mostly working on the G5 Joint Force, supporting the G5, uh, developing and implementing uh, its uh, engagement uh, to have an internal mechanisms uh, to, to better protect civilians, to identify, respond, 
uh, to civilian casualties. But I will mostly focus on the general overview and mostly on the, on the result of this research. Firstly, we should recognize that the G5 uh, was not totally a failure, and it is not totally a failure. Bringing together five different countries that has like past, uh, let's say, issues of mistrust, uh, bringing them together to share information, to conduct joint operations, and actually being able like to form such a coalition in, in a very short moment and having like deploy six to nine operations, uh, let's say somehow it is a success, uh, 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 even if people was expecting a lot from the G5. I used to say that it took decades for the international coalition in Afghanistan to get results. So it, it's, I also understand, you know, why there is pressure, but at the same time, recognize progress that different state has made. That said, I also acknowledge those questions, uh, especially as international forces are withdrawing. Normally, the withdrawal of international forces uh, will not actually question the effectiveness of the G5. Actually, it should not, because it's supposed to be five African countries coming together and international forces are most like bringing support. But the fact that the withdrawal of international forces is questioning the effectiveness of the G5, really bring those questions on the table. And I will try to draw some kind of uh, comment. Uh, one is, there is this idea of like having, uh, let's say, an African Union ECOWAS or a continental uh, 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 force. It can be the ECOWAS standard force, it can be an Afri the African Union st standard, standby force that can intervene in context of, uh, let's say, terrorism. But for me, the question is, there is still now not a lot of framework that will really make that being possible. So, uh, and even if there is a framework, sometimes ad hoc coalition seems to be more effective, quick to mobilize, and also depend on political interest. You've just uh, mentioned, Linda, the fact that the situation, for example, uh, between Mali and Niger is also influencing uh, uh, or deteriorating the situation because it's benefiting sometimes for to uh, some armed opposition group uh, because the lack of coordination and the political tension can affect the effectiveness of joint operations. So those political <coughs> interests also has to be considered because especially a uh, 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 country do not have sometimes the same interests. So if you have a kind of, you know, echo us, echo us, uh, um, let's say uh, you want to mobilize echo us, uh, uh, troops, it take more time because it add countries. It also add like political interest. It also add political sensitivity and require sometimes specific, specific framework. The second thing I want to speak about is the bureaucracy. You know, if you move from the African Union and you come back to the ECOWAS, it take a lot, even for the G5, there was a lot of bureaucracy. But the fact that the G5 was focusing on operations was giving them some kind of, you know, a possibility to be more sharp uh, than if it was like some kind of, uh, let's say, um, global coalition. Uh, the other one is the kind of resources issue. We have seen, you know, many, many countries coming together are not prioritizing the resources, let's say, on operations, on military operations as others. So uh, can people, let's say, from Senegal will pay for operations to be conducted in Mali uh, uh, by increasing, let's say, their defense, their defense budget? This is a big question. Does the African Union or ECOWAS has enough resources uh, to do it? This is another question. Then there is this idea of sovereignty when it comes to countries. Like uh, mostly we've seen most countries say, we, we can share operations. The G5 is okay because it's our own battalion doing operation within our country. So we can share intel and being able to come together. So we keep our control, we keep our command, but this is the same kind of failure and also like the reason why countries uh, could, could come and join together for operations. Then there is also the fact that some international partners who can come in to support 
uh, those operations will question how far coalitions will prioritize the protection of civilians and will apply international humanitarian law, uh, 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 especially in the fact that uh, uh, if they're questioning the fact that some countries are not really prioritizing the protection of civilians. So then this brings me to, to some, so these are questions that, that we, sh we still keep asking ourselves. So then this brings me to, to some, key, some key insight that I want to share. First of all, I think uh, we should start developing concrete and practical framework when it comes to coalition, for, uh, 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 to the formation of coalition, especially from the African Union standpoint. I believe that the future of uh, the war in the continent will mostly, of responding to terrorism in the continent, will mostly be sub-regional coalition. We've seen it, for example, in Mozambique, calling Rwanda to support and trying to call some other countries to do it. We have seen it somehow in CAR with the presence of Rwanda and others. Uh, we've also seen it like in Sudan and in East Africa in some, in some, some areas. So this will be the, the way people will try to go. We see how we share interests, we look at our neighbor and we, we seek for support. So the African Union should put up framework for that. We'll, and the framework should be very concrete. How you form it, what are the conditions, what are the specificities, how should we include protection of civilians, how we apply those things, where do we find resources, and when do we call uh, international partners on which conditions? And how are we ensuring that international partners' interests are not going to, uh, uh, let's say, influence too much uh, how, how those regional coalitions are formed? And those framework, even if at the African Union level, should give flexibilities to countries that are, are organizing themselves to be really able to prioritize what kind of a cooperation they want to have. It can be Intel, it can be joint operations, it can be a joint command, it can be partnered operation or security force assistance. It depends on how they want, they want to do it. Uh, secondly, that framework should then come at uh, some existing regional bodies like Eastern Af East African community, ECOWAS, uh, uh, SADEC, and you know, others, other structures so that they can also find a way to apply and to develop the, the framework. But they should do it now because we find ourselves in mostly being in a reactive situation than in a proactive situation. ECOWAS take too long to respond to the terrorism. Now look at what's going on. We have the MNGTF, we have the G5 Joint Force, we have the ACRA initiatives. We have a lot of initiatives that will take too much time to coordinate uh, uh, and to put together now uh, than if the ECOWAS could be able to be proactive. So we should do it now, and we start doing it, including for regions that are not really facing the kind of high level of, uh, let's say, terrorist threat. And I think finally, we should really be able to fix those issues of sovereignty versus, uh, uh, you know, uh, joint operations, and also in terms of resources. There is a debate on we should put those those forces under UN UN mission, under UN mandate, or under UN authority because it can bring more resources. But there is a way, you know, Africans can really come together to face that, that, that common challenge. And finally, I think there is this issue also of how we combine military operation versus other, other means yeah, to fight terrorists. It can be dialogue, it can be other, other kind of means. Those kind of framework should also include those kind of local and internal political responses. Uh, and not only focusing on military on military response. Thank you. Thank you very much. Interesting uh, suggestions. Um, I think that the work that the African Union has been doing in the Lake Chad Basin countries through its regional stabilization strategy provides us with some pointers on the way forward. I, I smiled when you talked about the fact that ECOWAS did not respond um, uh, in time when the crisis hit in Mali, which is also in part the reason why we're being overrun. And I smiled because I asked myself, it's a huge commitment. I do recall when um, Mali started, the first mission that was mandated was AFISMA and the dynamics that went into it plus the cost 
So let's hear from uh, Dr. Fifi Eduafo, who is a senior research fellow. Oh, he joined us, but it seems he's falling off again. Well, in his stead, I'm going to ask another one of the authors, Dr. Andrew Yauchi, uh, to uh, step in and to basically uh, give us an overview of the four options that they have proposed in the, in the um, report. In the meantime, there are some questions. There's at least one question in the chat. Um, and I encourage those of us online to also continue to put questions up so that our panelists will be able to reflect on them and provide us with answers in due course. So uh, Dr. Chi, if you are ready, you've got 10 minutes, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Linda. And thank you colleagues for taking the time to join us today. Um, uh, just to, to start with the, the four options, and it, this is not to say that the four options are uh, sort of uh, tentative or shall I say firm uh, frameworks that we suggest, but obviously during the time and the period at which we were looking at the, this research or conducting this research, these are options that we think uh, are were coming out from the interviews and people that we were speaking to. And so the, the first option really, as we see, was to uh, reconfigure, but also uh, scale up the G5 Sahel. Now, this option here is really looking at the existing system that has been put in place, uh, but also given some of the challenges uh, of coordination uh, and what have you from other models, we felt that it was really important for this model to continue uh, in the sense that you have an existing institution that took two to three years to establish, uh, to figure out co uh, coordination mechanisms, to coordinate uh, the relevant information. And so upgrading this model to maybe being reconfigured, but also having the options of being able to include uh, other countries that can support and contribute to this uh, model was uh, we see as the sort of initial uh, situation, uh, initial model, the best option at, at hand. However, given the situation, as you know, of uh, uh, the Mali withdrawing from the G5 Sahel, we then argue that uh, the second option, uh, which would have been um, a reconfigured G5 Sahel, but converting that uh, into or utilizing the option of being able to draw on uh, African forces from other uh, parts of the country. And so this leads us to the second option, which is really about reconfiguring uh, the G5. So, and I think it's important to say that with that, with, throughout all of these options, we suggest that the G, reconfiguring the G5 so is the fundamental part uh, to moving things forward. And this is because uh, in order for things to move forward, creating new coalitions or creating new uh, frameworks within the region, we don't see as a, as a, as a complementary uh, aspect but actually maybe something that could uh i think create more friction and i say this because uh, as glenn has mentioned more recently the niger president has come out and said something quite controversial about the g5 Sahel. but in essence what we see is is something that includes mali includes all of these countries is important and so the second option really is about how do we move from that g5 Sahel to more of a african uh focused uh model uh, and here we argue that utilizing uh, not only uh, an ECOWAS uh, would be a good option, uh, but also broadening uh, the space to include other countries from the, the wider West Africa would also be an option that we should look at as well. Um, the third model we suggest in, in this is looking at a pure ECOWAS uh, force. Uh, we don't find favor for this, uh, and particularly because of the political uh, structure of ECOWAS, but also the political challenges that ECOWAS might have, uh, trying to get authorization and whatnot. We don't see this as an ultimate uh, model for the region, but it's a model that we put forward because there was a sense that it needed to be more West African led, uh, needed to be more structured, uh, but also uh, controlling to a large extent, which is one of the, the founding themes that we see throughout all of the interviews that there needed to be more control uh, over the of the forces but also over the situation as well uh, and then the fourth model which is uh, similar to what the un security can uh, secretary general has proposed uh, and similar to what the au has been doing in in uh, in somalia was to have more of a uh, echo uh, sorry an amazon form uh, where you would have forces uh, from the region contribute uh, but also 
uh, in essence, it be African led. Uh, so in this case, uh, uh, an AU peace support operation or a peace enforcement operation uh, with the gradual intervention uh, of other countries. Uh, and this, when I talk about other countries, talk about maybe other countries like Ghana who have uh, peacekeeping uh, experience, uh, Senegal, uh, but also you can draw in Rwanda and whatnot. And here, what we see as a, a good, as the sort of option that we are putting forward at this point is that each of these different countries have different experiences. So for example, we talk about in the report, the, utilizing Kenya's experience in counterterrorism, Ethiopia, uh, Uganda as well, uh, and Rwanda, uh, but then later on bringing in forces like Ghana, Senegal, uh, who have uh, long-standing peacekeeping experience once the conditions allow for that as well. So we don't see this as, as fixed models, we see this as transitional. Uh, and you can argue uh, to a degree that each of the models in some way or form complement one another uh, to try and provide uh, different scenarios, but also an evolving, uh, an evolving scenario that evolves to the situation that we find ourselves uh, uh, in, in the region. Um, and I'll leave it there, Linda. I saw that, um, oh, I realized I was muted earlier. Thank you very much, Andrew, for giving us those four options. I saw that CC uh, was on. Uh, yes, he is now. So, Dr. Fifi Oduafo, are you on and able to join us? Probably not. Okay. Probably not. Okay. All right. Um, please let me know when uh, he gets on. Um, thank you very much to our three um, panelists for giving us. Uh, the country specific, the angle from the protection of civilians, and now the four options that we may wish to consider. Um, I see that Cedric's hand is already up. Um, and so Cedric, I'll give you the floor now. Thank you so much, uh, Linda. And uh, sorry for jumping straight back in, but I thought, uh, um, the comments that both uh, Delina and uh, Viani made uh, on the report was, was so interesting that I couldn't uh, help but just want to engage immediately. Because I think um, and the various options in the report that Andrew shared with us perhaps presuppose uh, that there would obviously need to be political negotiations in the region. Uh, and. The, the immediate region, the G5, but then ECOWAS, the West Africa, African Union, and all these levels, of course, with key partners in the United Nations as well, about which of these configurations, uh, you know, would probably most likely be useful. And this, of course, will also come out of this joint assessment that is that is upcoming. But I think the point that Vianney made that that none of these would really work, and I think this was Delina's point as well, unless you have some kind of shared political commitment, some kind of a shared vision uh, of what it is we want to achieve in the region, um, including with such a force. A force like that we know from our broader effectiveness of peace operations network studies can only be as effective as the joint will that it helps to support. It's just a tool to help support a political project. And the effectiveness of any such force depends greatly on the degree to which there's a coherent commitment to that political project. And I think what I've heard Vianney saying is that, and Delina also, is that that project is in a sense missing. You know, what is exactly the commitment? Is there a shared commitment at the moment among some of the key, key actors? And then I think the other point that was also for me very important in this context is, you know, uh, are we overly relying on the concept of a force, on a securitized solution, when this is essentially you know, a political problem? Um, and I think you mentioned yourself, Linda, the, the, the regional stabilization strategy and the work around that in the, in the Lake Chad context. Uh, what I find missing in many of the discussions around the G5 cell force, and I think this is why the authors also focused on this adaptive stabilization strategy in the report, is the need to link the whatever security force they may be, of course, with this larger political framework, 
but then also with uh, particular um, civilian stabilization, peace building, development type projects that can address some of the drivers of the conflict. And where we see the security element only as a last resort and only relating to perhaps acting with those actors that are not within the political solution, that do not want to be, that do not have a political interest, if you like, in, in, in finding a long-term solution. So I think those were, for me, very, very important uh, points that, that both Delina and, and Viani raised. And maybe just the last thing to say is that I, I agree very much, I think, with Viani's analysis that for me, the long term, longer term trend does seem to be for regional solutions. Uh, the United Nations, perhaps even to a large degree, the African Union, if there's an operation like AMISOM, is something that will always have to be temporary. It's something with a, with a start and a stop, whereas neighbors remain neighbors for forever. And so that regional commitment to finding solutions, I think, is critical to, to look, even if it's not um, clear in the short term exactly what that should be. And that's why we need this engagement in terms of seeking a, a political framework. Uh, in the longer term, we know that, that the neighbors, the immediate region, are the ones who have a shared interest in the, in this, in the security and the, the political stability of the region. Thanks back to you, Linda. Thank you very much, Cedric. And um, we've got a question for Delina uh, from Amina. Um, whether you think that Niger, the government of Niger involves uh, the military in its decision making, uh, the political decision making on this particular issue? And how do we consider military will expectations and political vision? So, how do these two meet? Um, yeah. You've got a I'm going to I'm going to answer that. Thank you, Linda. I'm going to answer that quickly and then just address back um, something that Cedric said. Um, I think they do. I think they do quite a lot. I mean, if we just just even simply simply and if we want to look at this from a political standpoint, the presence of Abu Tarka, which is the the uh, the general in charge of the high authority for the consolidation of peace in Niger um, is the, I mean, he's being referred to uh, in many different ways here, uh, but I think the way that would encapsulate it uh, more clearly is the, the right uh, arm, the right hand um, of, um, of Bazoum. So he is he's uh, someone who's been in the military. He's been the leader of the HACP for 11 years now. Um, and uh, he definitely has Bazoum's ear. I think we should also we should also make a bit of a distinction between the different forces. So I wouldn't necessarily say that, for example, the gendarmerie has the same level of receives the same level of attention from the Nigerian government as the Garde Nationale, which is much more on the front lines. And uh, and so so I think. I would say yes, but with a, with a caveat on which force exactly would you mean? Um, on something that Cedric said, uh, so you know this this idea of willingness, and you summarized it really well. I think what uh, what what my point and potentially Vianney's uh, points were. I think I mean something that really struck me, and this is why I believe we have we have a perception that is deeply flawed if we talk about what is taking place here with a view from a place like, once again, Brussels. I mean, in Brussels, my perception of European forces here was one of unity or at least coordination and collaboration. And then you come here, you speak with the different forces and you realize they say hi to each other when they see each other at the base or whenever they, they share a base, it depends on which force and where, et cetera. Uh, but this unity is something that is much more a discursive practice rather than something that actually takes place in the region. And if we're not seeing this with the Europeans, with which arguably have been is at the same time for years, Iraq, Afghanistan, et cetera, um, we cannot expect, and uh, it's wishful thinking to expect the same of the joint force as soon as it is created. So I agree with Yane that, that this is 
what the future holds, um, but uh, I think it's going to take way more time than we think. Thank you very much. Um, the floor is open now. I just have a, one question because when I looked at the title of the report, I felt, wow, this could actually also uh, lead us to reflecting on how to uh, fund some of these operations. We know that the MNJTF um, has thrived very, very well because Nigeria basically bankrolls it. And ad hoc security initiatives that have worked well have worked well because member states have chipped in. In the case of the um, LRA, RCIF. So now that we're looking at alternative options, what are some of the alternative options uh, available to us? How can we reflect on funding um, for, because we know that it's been very difficult for the G5 Sahel to receive uh, funding from the UN. So with the French gone, how are we going to do it? And I see that Vianney has a sign up already. You're still muted. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, and I think funding is exactly, as you say, one of the issues. And um, the, the European Union has really, uh, you know, was uh, uh, supporting uh, the G5 uh, Joint Force and the G5 Secretariat. Uh, and there was like the kind of main support. And the EU did not stop its support to the G5 because like uh, French Operation Barkan Leave, which was actually is a kind of good sign. My understanding is the idea is not uh, to avoid any kind of international solidarity when it comes to supporting uh, African, uh, let's say, responses uh, 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 to, to terrorists or joint operations. But first of all, they should be uh, uh, a kind of uh, uh, contribution from countries that are facing those situations. But uh, even if those countries do not have enough resources, they should be any kind of uh, um, continental solidarity when, when it comes to that. I remember General Hanena when he was uh, 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 the first commander of the G5, went to Rwanda requesting a, a battalion from Rwanda to the G5. He received a no at that time because I believe the answer was, will it be a G6 plus Rwanda? But he came back with, I think, something like a million, it's a million, million, million USD as, as random support to the, to the G5, something like that. And it's important that kind of solidarity to sometimes come back to that. I was questioning like mostly African general when we were organizing this Pan-African workshop on protection of civilians in Niger and where we invited like many African countries and many African general officers. Uh, we, we can see the debate in the Sahel is, is it Wagner? Uh, shall it be uh, like uh, 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 European Takuba forces? Shall it be France? But in those discussions, where is Uganda? Where is Senegal? Where is Ethiopia? Where is South Africa? Where is uh, Ghana? Where is, you know, like, let's say Algeria? So where is the other African contributions? And those contributions is not only speaking about money. It can be a country providing any kind of material support. It can be a country coming in to support any kind of internal uh, political solutions, because we've seen that sometimes stabilization in a country uh, will depend also, will affect also how the country is responding to the crisis. What we've been saying sometimes is like, uh, 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 we, we mostly focus on financial resources, but there are many kind of other means that countries, African countries can provide that are not discussed. You can send material, you can send troops. We've been seeing that many, many of these uh, uh, of countries here are facing any kind of air support um, uh, here. So what, what are those African countries with a kind of very high air support capacities that can come here and support, you know, the G5 coalition. It can be also, you know, coalition by, by interest, by specificities, by force. Uh, Rwanda is very far from Mozambique. You have seen Mali moving uh, from like uh, uh, its idea of diversifying partners as now we are questioning Wagner, including within Mali, Malian armies. 
to they move like from Mali to Rwanda to go speak with Rwanda, like they need some instructor. So it, it, there is many kind of political interest, many kind of things going on. But ways should be like to to think at resources from a flexible point of view, and not considering only money money as as final as financial resource and contribution. Then finally, it also should be some kind of support uh, uh, because uh, I hear Cedric saying that there are also internal issues, and African countries also should be able to step in, not only by doing uh, uh, you know they should be more when it comes to national crisis. This will include supporting like international dialogue. Look on one, what is going on in the Sahel. Burkina Faso has started the dialogue internally. They say we'll combine dialogue uh, with military operation. Niger is doing the same, and Mali was saying was planning to do the same. But every country will discuss in bilateral with you know its own citizens or its own group. But we all know that those groups are not even like national base. They are like within within the cross border. So one idea is why those kind of dialogue efforts are not continuing at the national level, but having something also at the regional level. Because otherwise, you can find those kind of accord, like I have a peace accord, or I don't know any negotiation agreement with a group, and my country is safe. But what about my neighbor? This happened uh, some, sometimes as well with Burkina Faso. So then, yeah, effort should really be like a very mixed and uh, let's say specialize uh, when we look at other. Thank you very much. I will abuse the position of my, the chair to ask Andrew uh, a, a question here. Uh, and it's the fact that we've heard, and this is not the first time, that we need to have political solutions to, to these challenges. So, um, Andrew, in your work, how do we engender political will, particularly in the context of the mistrust between the, the uh, countries involved in the G5 Sahel, and perhaps even more so now with the uh, little challenge between Niger and Mali? And uh, if I may just add on to that, particularly, I look at now the um, the fact that the uh, joint assessment for the Sahel is going to be led by a Nigerian. So do you see any challenges for that as well? Thank you. Uh, so to answer your last question, I think that there might be a challenge in the sense that um, it might make others feel uh, left out of the process. Um, th there is a sense that, uh, and I think Vienna and Cedric and, and Delaney have all mentioned this in, in some ways that you need to be able to bring these people together. And, and I think that's, that is what was key from our report was that despite some of the suggestions that we make, um, the political, and we say this sort of in the introduction, uh, was missing and it still is missing. And so until you are able to bring all of these parties together uh, to have these negotiations, to have these discussions, then it becomes a sort of a, a continuous stalemate. Um, and even if you were to look at uh, the multinational joint task force, um, even though uh, Nigeria supplies uh, the, the bulk of the money, you still have these political conversations that are taking place, which are key, uh, because ultimately these, these terrorist cells or groups are moving, as uh, Vienna said, rightly pointed out, across these borders. And I think there needs to be a wider conversation, and we sort of suggest this uh, in the report, uh, to bring together everyone, um, not just uh, the, the G5 cell, but the wider region. Um, I know more recently, I think it's on Monday, that Togo has uh, declared a state of emergency uh, due to some of what it describes as a terrorist situation. So again, uh, what are we doing as a wider West Africa to discuss these issues and these challenges, but also uh, to move things forward politically? Uh, and I think these uh, African leaders, despite their challenges and differences, need to move towards this, have these discussions. And, and they could be at different, different levels, ministerial levels, they could be at um, defence levels, uh, and then presidential levels and two things settled, but these conversations uh, do need to take place. And that, and that is key. Uh, I think there is merit also in exploring maybe how the AU could facilitate this. And, and uh, what I mean facilitate, I don't mean take control, but uh, maybe... Uh, jump in uh, to sort of guide some of the discussions on this uh, to be able to move things forward uh, because at the moment 
uh, it's a bit of a challenge with ECOWAS, uh, particularly given the situation with, with one of the countries. But again, how can ECOWAS and the AU uh, work together to, to do this as well? And this is a, a crucial point. Another point I just want to make quite uh, quickly before I, I pass it back to you and hopefully answering your question, Linda, is that even though you have this, this um, void uh, in terms of the political space, uh, I think there still is uh, efforts could be made uh, between the, the four countries uh, to move things forward. Now, Niger and Mali have their differences uh, and whatnot, but you can still start a little striker conversation with other leaders to look at how things can be done, uh, to have that this conversation about what the um, what the sort of options are, uh, but also to to try and uh, negotiate when it comes to this situation, because each state is taking things or using a different approach. And I think what what is missing is saying, okay, as a region or as a G five collective, this is the approach we intend to use to deal with things. Uh, and you know, Mali takes a harder approach than Niger, which is trying to use a combination. But I also think there's there's merit in looking at what Mauritania has done. Uh, and I don't think it's necessarily about the money per se, but it's also about saying, okay, how do we deal with these terrorists, which are homegrown uh, versus the international terrorists that are sort of imported? And how do we have this wider discussion with our communities, with our people? Uh, and how do we meet this governance gaps that exist? Uh, all of this needs to be dealt with. Uh, and I think the conversation here for me is about not just the ministerial level, but also more empowerment to uh, the people itself. Uh, and I think that's the se se sort of second part of the report, or should I say the fourth part, which looks at the adaptivity of uh, the AU and also the models should move towards that. And what I mean by that is that there is so much focus on the sort of national, international dynamic, a little focus on the everyday people as well. And I think that is, uh, some of the, the things that we recognize in the report, but also see, uh, we don't touch on per se, but we see from the interviews that Mauritania was brought up as an example where not only the military is used, um, uh, but also the wider uh, society communities are brought together to discuss the challenges, uh, but also um, to find ways to plug in uh, and move things forward. Right. Thank you very much. Um... James Gadin has put up a, a number of uh, very interesting points and I encourage everyone to go onto the chat and to have a look. There is somebody who has been quietly listening to all of this conversation and um, I'm sure that she has uh, a lot to say also on this given that she has to deal with the Sahel and this is the special representative for the Sahel. So, May I please give you the floor now? Um, oh, there you are. You've got the floor, please. Thank you so much, Linda. Yes, I have been listening um, and, uh, and with uh, a great deal of interest. Uh, it, uh, we have been discussing the, the report previously with, uh, with the, the team. Uh, so so uh, I, I thought I have given some comments previously to those who have really been working on it. Uh, but now I have been invited to give some, some final comments. So, so that's what I will do. Uh, first, uh, allow me to thank uh, NUPI, IPON and the Training for Peace program for this uh, webinar. Uh, and of course, also to, to thank the, the writers uh, of this brand new report on the G5 Sahel Joint Force. Uh, we see this as a very timely report that draws up different alternatives to combat the violence and the terrorist threat in the region. Uh, as this discussion illustrates, it comes in the midst of the political discussions engaging both the West African region, the international community and the members of the Security Council. Uh, the, the, the UN Security General's recent visit to West Africa highlighted an alarming situation, both in the political, security, humanitarian and human rights spheres. And as the governance crisis continues to get in the way for development in too many countries, it also hampers governments from fulfilling their responsibilities to their populations. Norway is deeply worried about the lack of protection of the civilian population in the region, 
and increased human rights violations and abuses committed in Mali, including by Malian forces and the Wagner Group. In his last report, the UN Secretary General accounts the highest number of civilian casualties to date recorded in Mali, also due to attacks committed by terrorists and armed groups. And this weekend, we again heard terrible news about around 80 civilians killed in northern Burkina Faso in attacks attributed to jihadists. This is a development that has to stop. And to stop it, we need a holistic approach where strong political engagement, dialogue and development to the benefit of the Sahelian population go hand in hand with military action. Root causes for conflict and violence must be addressed. This is a central point in the Norwegian strategy for the Sahel region. We echo the Secretary General's calls for the G5 Sahel authorities to uphold and protect human rights. This is important for the success of efforts to combat terrorism, improve security and gain the trust of the communities. This is why Norway continues to support the full implementation of the G5 Sahel Joint Force uh, is a human rights compliance framework developed by the UN Human Rights Office. Let me take you back to early 2021, when the, Sahel, uh, the Sahelian presidents met in Jamena in February 2021, they adopted a statement, statement highlighting the need for a political and civilian search to address the security situation. This was a positive step that was included in the Sahel coalition's new roadmap. Unfortunately, the military coups that happened in the region the following months put a halt to this course of action, with the focus shifting to finding agreements on transitional periods and return to constitutional order. The Sahel coalition's revised roadmap will have to reflect this changed political context. It will also have to reflect the changes in the security architecture as Barkhan and Task Force Takuba are now leaving Mali. And to turn this negative trend and make positive changes happen, the Sahelian governments themselves need to show genuine ownership to the process, not only in words, but also in action. Uh, as many have said, Mali is at the core of the problem. No, Mali has announced that it has suspended its participation in the G5 Sahel, and we have heard the president of Niger declaring that the G5 Sahel Joint Force is dead. This has created frustration both in the region and among partners. We expect that the G5 Sahel countries find a way to overcome these political challenges to allow for the cooperation and common efforts to continue. In the consultations on MINUSMA this week, Norway underlined what we must, that we must now collectively consolidate MINUSMA's mandate. In our view, this should include an increase in the mission's troop ceiling to allow for better protection of civilians. Norway also sees the need for a more robust and cross-border effort. This is why we have been supporting, have been supportive of a UN support office for the G5 Sahel Joint Force. Realistically, we do see limitations of what robustness could be achieved within MINUSMA as a country-specific UN peacekeeping operation. Therefore, while renewing MINUSMA's mandate, the proposed AU-UN Joint Strategic Assessment for the Sahel should include a thorough discussion on the need for a robust regionally-led cross-border counter-terrorism force to address the increasing challenge from terrorism in Mali and the wider region. This joint AU-UN initiative makes up a timely attempt to find common solutions on security and development issues for the Sahel. We look forward to former President Isufu's lead on this issue in cooperation with the UN but also and the AU, but also ECOWAS and the G5 Sahel, building on the experience of the G5 Sahel Joint Force. To conclude, first, we must consolidate and uphold MINUSMA's strong mandate as a key stabilizer for Mali and the region. Second, 
new thinking around the security architecture for Sahel and West Africa should have a holistic approach and ensure ownership by countries in the region. The engagement of coastal states is also positive. Third, discussions cannot shy away from tougher issues like financing and mandates for robust regionally led operations. This must be matched by human rights due diligence and human rights compliance frameworks. The joint UNAU assessment must lead to conclusions that are bold enough to make a real difference while also implementable. This new report from EPON fuels the discussion with constructive and solution-oriented proposals. Norway stands ready to continue supporting such discussions. I thank you. And we thank you very much for those thought-provoking, politically incorrect comments. You have spoken what is the truth and not try to sugarcoat it. So thank you very much for putting those thoughts out, uh, out for us as well. Ladies and gentlemen, we are three minutes out of the hour and I'll just like to find out if there's anyone with a burning comment to make. I do not see any hands up, so I'd like to thank you very, very much. Thank you to um, Nupi for organizing this webinar but perhaps more importantly for putting together the whole team and the report. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming on to listen and to contribute. We look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the day. Bye. Thank you very much, everyone. And thank you, Linda, for moderating us. Thank you very much. Have a good, good rest of your day.